Hi, welcome to our channel of IGNU Audiobooks, Indira Gandhi National Open University, School of Engineering and Technology, SOIT, Diploma Postgraduate Diploma Programs, Postgraduate Diploma in Industrial Safety, PG DINS, Semester 2, MEV 005 Occupational Health and Safely, Block 1 Basic of Health, 3.0 Introduction, The Basic Concepts of Health and Well-Being and How Environmental Factors Have a bearing on health have been dealt with in the previous units. Have you ever realized that many individuals spend nearly one-third of their adult life at their workplace and the nature of work and the working environment could, in fact, be an important determinant of their health and overall well-being? A wide array of hazardous exposures can occur at workplace predisposing them to several kinds of health risks or aggravating pre-existing diseases. Around 30 to 50 percent of workers report different types of hazardous physical, chemical or biological exposures or overload of unreasonably heavy physical work that may be deleterious to health and to working capacity. An equal number of working people report psychological overload at work resulting in stress symptoms. In addition to unnecessary human suffering, the costs involved in these health hazards have been estimated to amount up to several percent of some countries' gross national product, GNP. Moreover, rapid changes in the modern working life is associated with increasing demands of learning new skills, need to adapt to new types of work, pressure of higher productivity and quality of work, hectic job schedule, and with growing psychological workload and stress among the workforce. Such Developments require higher priority to be given to psychosocial aspects of work and a work environment. Hence, occupational health and the well-being of working people are crucial prerequisites for productivity and are of utmost importance for overall socio-economic and sustainable development. 3.1 Objectives After going through this unit, you should be able to define occupational health and describe the importance of occupational health and safety enumerate the principles of ergonomics and its application in the work environment, describe the various types of occupational hazards and how hazard analysis and risk assessment is done in industries, describe important occupational diseases, and describe various modalities of prevention and control of occupational diseases. 3.2 Concept of Occupational Health let us first understand the definition and concept of occupational health before we can study the hazards and diseases associated with various occupation. In this section, you will also learn about the prevention and control of occupational diseases. 3.2.1 Definition and Concept The Joint ILO-WHO Committee on Occupational Health In its first session held in 1950, gave the following definition. Occupational health should aim at the promotion and maintenance of the highest degree of physical, mental and social well-being of workers in all occupations, the prevention among workers of departures from health caused by their working conditions, the protection of workers in their employment from risks resulting from factors adverse to health, the placing and maintenance of the worker in an occupational environment. Adapted to his physiological and psychological equipment, and, to summarize, the adaptation of work to man and of each man to his job. Occupational health deals with all aspects of health and safety in the workplace and has a strong focus on primary prevention of hazards. The health of the workers has several determinants, including not just the risk factors at the workplace, resulting in cancers, accidents, musculoskeletal diseases, respiratory diseases, hearing loss, stress-related disorders to name a few but also social and individual factors and access to health services. Employment and working conditions in the formal or informal economy embrace other important determinants like working, hours, salary, workplace policies concerning leaves, health promotion and protection, provisions, etc., about 45% of the world's population and 58% of the population over 10 years of age belong to the global workforce. Their work sustains the economic and 
material basis of society, which is critically dependent on their working capacity, health at work and healthy work environments are among the most valuable assets of individuals, communities and countries. Occupational health is an important strategy not only to ensure the health of workers, but also to contribute positively to productivity, quality of products, work motivation, job satisfaction, and thereby to the overall quality of life of individuals and society. 3.2.2 Problem Statement Disease Burden, Global Burden, as per WHO, about 120 million occupational accidents with 0.2 million fatalities are estimated to occur annually and some 68 to 157 million new cases of occupational disease may be caused by various exposures at work. Occupational injuries account for 0.9% of the global DALI's lost burden of occupational diseases in India. The incidence of work-related morbidity and mortality in India is very high. It is estimated that 17 million occupational non-fatal injuries, 17% of the world, and 45,000 fatal injuries, 45% of the total deaths due to occupational injuries in world occur in India each year. 3.2.3 Ergonomics, Principles and Applications Ergonomics is now a well-recognized discipline and constitutes an integral part of any advanced occupational health service. The term ergonomics is derived from the Greek word ergon meaning work and nomos meaning law. Ergonomics can be defined simply as the study of work. More specifically, ergonomics is the science of designing the job to fit the worker rather than physically forcing the worker's body to fit the job. It simply means fitting the job to the worker. Training in ergonomics involves designing of machines, tools, equipment and manufacturing processes, layout of the places of work, methods of work and environment in order to achieve greater efficiency of both man and machine. The objective of ergonomics is to achieve the best mutual adjustment of man and his work for the improvement of human efficiency and well-being. The application of ergonomics has made a significant contribution to reducing industrial accidents and to the overall health and efficiency of the workers. Ergonomics draws on a number of scientific disciplines, including physiology, biomechanics, psychology, anthropometry, industrial hygiene, and kinesiology applications. Industries increasingly require higher production rates and advances in technology to remain competitive and stay in business. As a result, jobs today can involve frequent lifting, carry, and pushing or pulling loads without help from other workers or devices, increasing specialization that requires the worker to perform only one function or movement for a long period of time or day after day, working more than eight hours a day, working at a quicker pace of work, such as faster assembly line speeds, and having tighter grips when using tools, these factors especially if coupled with poor machine design, tool, and workplace, design or the use of improper tools, create physical stress on workers' bodies, which can lead to injury. If work tasks and equipment do not include ergonomic principles in their design, workers may have exposure to undue physical stress, strain, and overexertion, vibration, awkward postures, forceful exertions, repetitive motion, extreme temperatures, and Heavy lifting, recognizing ergonomic risk factors in the workplace is an essential first step in correcting hazards and improving worker protection. Ergonomists, industrial, engineers, occupational safety and health professionals, and other trained individuals believe that reducing physical stress in the workplace could eliminate up to half of the serious injuries each year. Employers can learn to anticipate what might go wrong and alter tools and the work environment to make tasks safer for their workers. Good ergonomics is good economics. 3.2.4 Sickness absenteeism. Sickness absenteeism occurs when employees miss work for reasons stemming from health problems. The rate of sickness absenteeism is linked to the overall 
health of the workforce, and also to specific factors in each individual profession, workplace policies, and national standards also impact the rate of sickness. Absenteeism as do cultural norms and personal attitudes among workers, sickness absence is an important health problem in industry. It may seriously impede production with serious cost repercussions, both direct as well as indirect. As the production techniques become more sophisticated, absenteeism tends to increase the adverse repercussions. Absenteeism is a useful index in industry to assess the state of health of workers and their physical, mental and social well-being. Absenteeism in workplace has a multitude of reasons, with sickness being the key one. But then not all sickness, absenteeism is attributable to sickness. Thus, sickness absenteeism may not be a true indicator of prevailing sickness in the workplace. A better indicator of health of the workers is the mortality statistics of workmen dying during their working lifespan and analysis of the mortality causes would help elicit the patterns of diseases specific to different industries incidents india has a working force of more than 5 million in registered factories research undertaken by the national productivity council npc into absenteeism showed a marked increase from around 8 to 13% in the early 1950s to around 15 to 20 percent or even more in recent years the rate of absenteeism was reported to be 8 to 10 days per head per year. Causes The causes of sickness absenteeism may not be entirely due to sickness. Economic causes Studies have shown that if the worker is entitled to sick, leave with pay, he tends to avail of this privilege by reporting sick. It is so well remarked that in industry the workers declare themselves fit or unfit for work at their choice. Social causes Certain social factors appear to influence sickness absenteeism in India. These are the social and family obligations such as weddings, festivals, repair and maintenance of ancestral house and similar other causes. Some of the workers who come from rural areas go back to their villages for short or long periods during sowing and harvest seasons. Medical causes about 10% of the days lost were found to be due. To occupational accidents. Respiratory and alimentary illnesses have also been found to be important causes, non occupational causes, certain non occupational causes such as nutritional disorders, alcoholism, and drug addiction have also been found to be responsible for sickness absenteeism. Prevention The prevention or reduction of sickness absenteeism would result in better utilization of resources and maximizing the production. The methods for reducing sickness absenteeism include good factory management and practices, adequate pre-placement examination, good human relations and application of ergonomics. 3.3 Occupational Hazards The occupational environment is a sum of external conditions and influences which prevail at the place of work and which have a bearing on the health of the working population. Basically, there are three types of interaction in a working environment. A. Man and physical, chemical and biological agents. B. Man and machine. C. Man and man. An industrial worker may be exposed to different types of hazards depending upon his occupation as follows. A. Physical hazards. B. Chemical hazards. C. Biological hazards. D. Mechanical hazards. E. Psychosocial hazards. These have been further elaborated. Table 3.1 Types of Hazards in an Industry Look at the screen. Let us now look at some of the occupational diseases that of public health, importance, those that significantly contribute to the morbidity pattern of a particular location, town M, state or even the entire country. 3.4 Occupational Dermatosis Occupational Dermatosis is a big health problem in many industries. These are skin disorders associated with exposure chemicals serotherogens into a place. Contact dermatitis is reported to comprise 90-95% of cases of occupational dermatosis. It includes irritant contact dermatitis 70-80%, allergic contact dermatitis 20-25%, 
and contact a ticaria. Contact a ticaria, less than 5% including immediate hypersensitivity reactions to food proteins and latex allergy. Other occupational dermatoses include infections, miliaria, psoriasis, perinacea, photosensitivity, stasis eczema, acne, chloracne, and depigmenting disorders. The causes of occupational dermatosis may be physical heat, cold, moisture, friction, pressure, X rays and other rays, chemical, acids, alkalis, dyes, solvents, grease, tar, pitch, chlorinated phenols, etc. Biological living agents such as viruses, bacteria, fungi, and other parasites, plant products, leaves, vegetables, fruits, flowers, vegetable dust etc. The dermatitis producing agents are further classified into primary irritants, e, g, acids, alkalis, dyes, solvents, etc. Cause dermatitis in workers exposed in sufficient concentration and for a long enough period of time. Sensitizing substances, on the other hand, allergic dermatitis occurs only in small percentage of cases, due to sensitization of the skin. Prevention Occupational dermatitis is largely preventable if proper control measures are adopted. Pre selection, the workers should be medically examined before employment, and those with an established or suspected dermatitis or who have a known predisposition to skin disease should be kept away from jobs involving a skin hazard. Protection The worker should be given adequate protection against direct contact by protective clothing, long leather gloves, aprons, and boots. The protective clothing should be frequently washed and kept in good order. There are also, what are known as barrier creams which must be used regularly and correctly. There is no barrier cream so far invented which will prevent dermatitis in all occupations. Personal hygiene, there should be available a plentiful supply of warm water, soap and towels. The worker should be encouraged and educated to make frequent use of these facilities. Adequate washing facilities in industry are a statutory obligation under the Factories Act. Periodic inspection, there should be a periodic medical checkup of all workers for early detection and treatment of occupational dermatitis. If necessary, the affected worker may have to be transferred to a job not exposing him to risk. The worker should be educated to report any skin irritation, no matter how mild or insignificant. 3.5 Occupational Lung Diseases Occupational lung diseases are occupational disorders affecting the respiratory system due to harmful exposures at workplace including organic and inorganic dusts, metals, molds and fungal spores etc. and can be classified as follows. Obstructive Occupational Airway Diseases Occupational Asthma Pneumoconiosis Coal Workers Pneumoconiosis Asbestosis Silicosis Hypersensitivity Pneumonitis Fungal pneumonitis like bagosis, farmers. Lung. Occupational respiratory cancers, bronchogenic carcinoma and mesothelioma. Due to asbestos exposure. Plural diseases, plural plaques due to asbestos. 3.5.1 Occupational asthma. Occupational asthma, OA, remains the most commonly recognized industrial lung disease in the developed world, however. Many cases remain unreported. The symptoms are similar to other forms of asthma except that they are linked to exposure to an agent that is encountered specifically in the occupational environment. Occupational asthma refers to the development of asthma following exposure to a known occupational sensitizer often with evidence of an elevated specific immunoglobulin E, EG, to the relevant occupational allergen. The first clue that Asthma may be linked to occupation as usually found in the history, if the patient reports improvement in symptoms occurring at weekends and on holidays. Rhinoconjunctivitis is often present and may precede the onset of lower respiratory tract symptoms. Establishing the link between symptoms to an agent at work often requires a methodical workup including more detailed lung function tests. Agents which can trigger ROA are adhesives. Metals, chemical coolants, resins, isocyanates, flour and grain dust, colophony and fluxes, latex, animals, shellfish in particular, aldehydes, wood dust, red seed occupations at risk of ore, animal handlers.
bakers and pastry makers, chemical workers, food processing workers, hairdressers, paint sprayers, nurses, timber workers, welders. 3.5.2 Pneumoconiosis These are a group of chronic lung conditions characterized by fibrotic changes in the lung tissue and other complications due to exposure to dusts of particle size. 0.5 to 3 micron. The hazardous effects of dusts on the lungs depend upon a number of factors such as chemical composition, fineness, concentration of dust in the air, period of exposure and health status of the person exposed. Therefore, the threshold limit values for different dusts are different. Also the period of exposure required for most pneumoconiosis to develop ranges between 10 to 15 years but may vary markedly. Several classifications of pneumoconiosis exists, however, to classify it on the basis of type of dust exposure and severity would be useful. The different diseases which have been associated with the inorganic and the organic dusts are presented in Table 3.2. Look at the screen. Table 3.2 Diseases Associated with Inorganic and Organics Dusts The most common pneumoconiosis reported from India include silicosis, asbestosis, coal workers' pneumoconiosis, bisonosis and bagososis, extrinsical urgic alveolitis. I reported less probably due to lack of diagnostic facilities. The diagnosis of pneumoconiosis is based on symptoms of shortness of breath, cough, History of exposure to occupational hazards, radiological evidence of interstitial lung disease and restrictive ventilatory defects on lung function testing. Salient aspects of some of the pneumoconiosis are as follows. 3.5.3 Silicosis Among the occupational lung diseases, silicosis is the most important pneumoconiosis reported from India and a major cause of permanent disability and mortality. It is caused by inhalation of dust containing free silica or silicon dioxide, CO2. It was first reported in India from the Kolar gold mines, Mysore, in 1947. Ever since, its occurrence has been uncovered in various other industries, e.g., mining industry, coal, mica, gold, silver, lead, zinc, manganese and other metals, pottery and ceramic industry, sandblasting, metal grinding building and construction work, rock mining, iron and steel industry and several others. In the mica mines of Bihar, out of 329 miners examined, 34.1% were found suffering from silicosis. In a ceramic and pottery industry, the incidence of silicosis was found to be 15.7%. The incidence of silicosis depends upon the chemical composition of the dust, size of the particles, duration of exposure and individual susceptibility. The higher the concentration of free silica in the dust, the greater the hazard. Particles between 0.5 to 3 micron are the most dangerous because they reach the interior of the lungs with ease. The longer the duration of exposure, the greater the risk of developing silicosis. It is found that the incubation period may vary from a few months up to six years of exposure, depending upon the above factors. Pathologically, silicosis is characterized by a dense nodular fibrosis, the nodules ranging from 3 to 4 mm in diameter. Clinically the onset of the disease is insidious. Some of the early manifestations are irritant cough, dyspnea on exertion and pain in the chest. With more advanced disease, impairment of total lung capacity, TLC, is commonly present. An X-ray of the chest shows snowstorm appearance in the lung fields. There is no effective treatment for silicosis. Fibrotic changes that have already taken place cannot be reversed. Prevention and control. The only way that silicosis can be controlled, if not altogether eliminated, is by, or rigorous dust control measures, e.g., substitution, complete enclosure, isolation, hydroblasting, good housekeeping, personal protective measures and or regular physical examination of workers. Osilicosis was made a notifiable disease under the Factories Act 1948 and the Mines Act 1952. 3.5.4 Anthracosis Previously it was thought that pulmonary anthracosis was inert. Studies indicate that there are two general phases in coal miners' pneumoconiosis. 
The first phase is labeled simple pneumoconiosis which is associated with little ventilatory impairment. This phase may require about 12 years of work exposure for its development. The second phase is characterized by progressive massive fibrosis, PMF. This causes severe respiratory disability and frequently results in premature death. Once a background of simple pneumoconiosis has been attained in the coal worker, a progressive massive fibrosis may develop out of it without further exposure to it. From the point of view of epidemiology, the risk of death among coal miners has been nearly twice that of the general population. Coal miners' pneumoconiosis has been declared a notifiable disease in the Indian Mines Act of 1952 and also compensatable in the Workmen's Compensation Amendment Act of 1959. 3.5.5 Bisinosis Bisinosis is due to inhalation of cotton fiber dust over long periods of time. The symptoms are chronic cough and progressive dyspnea, ending in chronic bronchitis and emphysema. India has a large textile industry employing nearly 35% of the factory workers. Incidence of bisinosis is reported to be 7 to 8%. In three independent surveys carried out in Mumbai, Ahmedabad, and Delhi. 3.5.6 Bagososis. Bagososis is the name given to an occupational disease of the lung caused by inhalation of bagasse or sugarcane dust. It was first reported in India by Ganguly and Pal in 1955 in a cardboard manufacturing firm near Kolkata. India has a large cane sugar industry. The sugar cane fiber which until recently went to waste is now utilized in the manufacture of paper, cardboard and rayon. Bagososis has been shown to be due to a thermophilic actinomycet 4, which the name thermoactinomyces cichuri was suggested. The symptoms consist of breathlessness, cough, hemoptysis and slight fever. Initially there is acute diffuse bronchiolitis. Skiogram may show mottling in lungs or shadow. There is impairment of pulmonary function. If treated early, there is resolution of the acute inflammatory condition of the lung. If left untreated, there is diffuse fibrosis, emphysema and bronchiectosis. Preventive measures Dust control, measures for the prevention and suppression of dust, such as wet process, enclosed apparatus, exhaust ventilation etc., should be used. Personal protection, personal protective equipment, masks or respirators with mechanical filters or with oxygen or air supply, may be necessary. Medical control, initial medical examination and periodical medical Checkups of the workers are indicated. Chemical control. By keeping the moisture content above 20% and spraying the bagasse with 2% propionic acid, a widely used fungicide, bagasse can be rendered safe for manufacturing use. 3.5.7 Asbestosis Asbestos is the commercial name given to certain types of fibrous materials. They are silicates of varying composition. The silica is combined with such bases as magnesium, iron calcium, sodium and aluminium. Asbestos is of two types, serpentine or chrysolite variety and the amphibole type. 90% of the world's production of asbestos is of the serpentine variety, which is hydrated magnesium silicate. The amphibole type contains little magnesium. The amphibole type occurs in different varieties, e.g., trochidolite, blue, amazite, brown, and anthrophilite, white. Asbestos fibers are usually from 20 to 500 mm in length and 0.5 to 50 mm in diameter. Asbestos is used in the manufacture of asbestos cement, fireproof textiles, roof tiling, brake lining, gaskets and several other items. Asbestos is mined in Andhra Pradesh, Chudapa, Bihar, Jharkhand, Karnataka AA, and Rajasthan Dash but most of it is imported from USSR. Canada, US and South Africa. Asbestos enters the body by inhalation, and fine dust may be deposited in the alveoli. The fibers are insoluble. The dust deposited in the lungs causes pulmonary fibrosis leading to respiratory insufficiency and death, carcinoma of the bronchus, mesothelioma of the pleura or peritoneum, 
and cancer of the gastrointestinal tract. The disease does not usually appear until after 5 to 10 years of exposure. The fibrosis in asbestosis is due to mechanical irritation, and is peribronchial, diffuse in character, and basal in location in contrast to silicosis in which the fibrosis is nodular in character and present in the upper part of the lungs. Clinically the disease is characterized by dyspnea which is frequently out of proportion to the clinical signs in the lungs. In advanced cases, there may be clubbing of fingers, cardiac distress and cyanosis. The sputum shows asbestos bodies which are asbestos fibers coated with fibrin. An X-ray of the chest shows a ground glass appearance in the lower two-thirds of the lung fields. Once established, the disease is progressive even after removal of the worker from contact. The preventive measures consist of, 1, use of safer types of asbestos, chrysotile and amazit, 2, substitution of other insulins, glass fiber, mineral wool, calcium silicate, plastic foams, etc. 3, rigorous dust control, 4, periodic examination of workers, biological monitoring, clinical, x-ray, lung function, and, 5, continuing research. 3.5.8 Farmer's Lung Farmer's Lung is due to the inhalation of moldy hay or grain dust. In grain dust or hay with a moisture content of over 30% bacteria and fungi grow rapidly, causing a rise of temperature to 40 to 50 degrees. See this heat encourages the growth of thermophilic actinomycetes, of which Micropolyspora phenia is the main cause of farmer's lung. The acute illness is characterized by general and respiratory symptoms and physical signs. Repeated attacks cause pulmonary fibrosis and inevitable lung damage and right heart failure. It is quite possible that this condition might be widespread in India considering the bulk of the population engaged in agricultural work. 3.5.9 Hypersensitivity pneumonitis Hypersensitivity pneumonitis, previously called extrinsical urgic alveolitis, refers to an allergic inflammatory pneumonitis following the repeated inhalation of organic material. Workers at risk include those with exposure to molds or fungal spore in agriculture, horticulture, forestry, cultivation of edible fungi or malt working, those handling moldy vegetables and those caring for or handling birds. Many of the classical forms have memorable names such as farmer's lung, malt worker's lung, mushroom worker's lung and bird fancier's lung. Recent attention has been drawn to the role of metal working fluids, MWF with three outbreaks reported in the UK probably occurring as a result of microbial contamination of MWF dispersed in the factory as a respirable mist. The disease has two patterns, the acute form, which presents like a nonspecific pneumonic illness, and the chronic form, which is manifested by a fibrotic disease affecting the upper lobes. History taking is crucial as most biochemical tests have a low yield. Lung biopsy characteristically shows a mixture of three pathologies, lung fibrosis, alveolitis and granuloma formation. The 3rd of May 2010 pleural disease asbestos-related pleural disease pleural plaques are the most common manifestation of past asbestos exposure. They are discrete circumscribed areas of hyaline fibrosis found on mainly parietal pleura. They are virtually always asymptomatic, and identified as an incidental finding on a chest radiograph or thoracic CT scan, particularly when partially calcified. 3.6 Occupational cancers Occupational cancer is caused wholly or partly by exposure to a cancer-causing agent, carcinogen, at work, or by a particular set of circumstances at work. Globally, 19% of all cancers are attributable to the environment, including work setting resulting in 1.3 million deaths each year. WHO's International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, has classified 107 agents, mixtures, and exposure situations as carcinogenic to humans. Most of the exposure risks for occupational cancer are preventable. It is estimated that occupational cancers are a leading cause of work-related death worldwide. It is difficult to determine a true figure for occupational cancers because of the latent nature of the disease. An individual might be exposed to a cause of cancer and not develop any noticeable symptoms until many years later. Certain characteristics common to most occupational cancers. Duration of exposure required for most occupational cancers range from 10 25 years.
age incidence of occupational cancers is much earlier as compared to the same cancer in general population. Site of cancer or the organ involved remains fixed in a particular industry. Manifestations of the cancer may occur even after the person has left that industry. Occupational cancer is caused by exposure to carcinogens in the workplace. Carcinogens are agents that cause the development or increase the incidence of cancer. There are three different types of occupational carcinogens. Biological carcinogens, some microorganisms such as viruses have been known to cause cancer, either by damaging cells directly or by decreasing the body's ability to control abnormal cells, for example hepatitis B, HIV viruses and so on. Chemical carcinogens, a number of chemicals are known to be carcinogenic. These chemicals may occur naturally, such as asbestos, be manufactured like vinyl chloride, or be byproducts of industrial processes. For example, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Physical carcinogens, agents such as ionizing and ultraviolet, UV, radiation, have the potential to cause cancer. Examples of ionizing radiation includes rays and alpha, beta and gamma radiation. UV radiation can be divided into a number of bands such as UVB, UVC etc., some of which are known to cause skin cancer. Table 3.4 Types of agents implicated for the different occupational cancers. Types of occupational cancers and agents responsible. Skin cancer, most common occupational cancer. Dyes, radiation and solvents, particularly those derived from coal tar lung cancer, asbestos, arsenic, nickel, chromium, beryllium, mining of radioactive material, bladder cancer, aniline dyes like benzodine, betanaphthalamine, oramine, magenta, leukemias, benzol, radiation and mining of radioactive material, liver cancer, vinyl chloride, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, wood dust, mesotheliomas, asbestos, crocidolite variety brain and central nervous system cancer, ionizing radiation. 3.7 Prevention and Control of Occupational Diseases In some regions, only 5 to 10 percent of workers in developing countries and 20 to 50 percent of workers in industrialized countries, with a very few exceptions, have access to occupational health services in spite of an evident need virtually at each place of work. The need for occupational health services is particularly acute in the developing and newly industrialized countries, mix. Furthermore, approximately 8 out of 10 of the world's workers live in these countries. Such services, if organized appropriately and effectively for all workers, would contribute positively not only to workers' health, but also to overall socio-economic development, productivity, environmental health and well-being of countries, communities, families, and dependents. Also the control of unnecessary costs from sickness absenteeism and work disability, as well as costs of health care and social security can be effectively managed with the help of occupational health. 3.7.1 Medical, Engineering, and Legislative Measures The various measures for the prevention of occupational diseases may be grouped under three heads, medical, engineering and statutory or legislative, Table 3.5. Table 3.5 Measures for Prevention of Occupational Diseases 3.7.2 Medical Measures Preplacement Examination Preplacement examination is the cornerstone of any efficient occupational health service. It is done at the time of employment to assess the worker's suitability for a particular industry and includes the worker's medical, family, occupational and social history, a thorough physical examination and a battery of biological and radiological examinations, e, g, chest x-ray, electrocardiogram, vision testing, urine and blood examination, special tests for endemic disease. A fresh recruit may either be totally rejected or given a job suited to his physical and mental abilities. The purpose of pre-placement examination is to place the right man in the right job, so that the 
worker can perform his duties efficiently without detriment to his health. This is ergonomics. The following is a list of some occupations in which it is risky to employ men suffering from certain diseases, type of exposure and undesirable conditions. 1. Lead anemia, hypertension, nephritis, peptic ulcer. 2. Diasma, skin, bladder and kidney diseases. Precancerous lesions. 3. Solvents liver and kidney disease, dermatitis, alcoholism. 4. Silicohealed or active tuberculosis of lungs, chronic lung disease. 5. Radium and X-rays signs of ill health, especially any blood disease. Preplacement examination will also serve as a useful benchmark for future comparison. Periodical examination, the exposure to the harmful agents in the work. Environment begins once the worker is recruited in a particular industry. Many diseases of occupational origin require months or even years for their development. Their slow development, very often, leads to their non-recognition in the early stages and this is harmful to the worker. This is the reason why a periodical medical checkup of workers is very necessary. When they handle toxic or poisonous substances, the frequency and content of periodical medical examinations will depend upon the type of occupational exposure. Ordinarily workers are examined once a year, but in certain occupational exposures, e.g., lead, toxic dyes, radium, monthly examinations are indicated. Sometimes, even daily examinations may be needed such as when irritant chemicals like dichromates are handled. The periodical examinations may be supplemented, where necessary by biological and radiological examinations. Medical and health care services The medical care of occupational diseases is a basic function of an occupational health service. In India, the Employees State Insurance Scheme provides medical care not only for the worker but also his family. Within the factory, first aid services should be made available. Properly applied first aid can reduce suffering and disability and hasten recovery. Notification The main purpose of notification in industry is to assess the magnitude of occupational diseases so as to initiate measures for prevention and protection and ensuring their effective application, and to investigate the working conditions and other circumstances which have caused or suspected to have caused occupational diseases. National Laws and Regulations Factories Act, 1976, Mines Act, 1952, Dock Labourers Act, 1948, etc. require the notification of cases and suspected cases of occupational disease. In the Factories Act, a list of 22 diseases is included while in the Mines Act. Three diseases and in the Dock Regulations eight diseases are listed. These diseases are also recognized internationally for the purpose of workmen's compensation. Supervision of Working Environment Periodic Inspection of Working Environment provides information of primary importance in the prevention of occupational disabilities. The physician should pay frequent visits to the factory in order to acquaint himself with the various aspects of the working environment, such as temperature, lighting, ventilation, humidity, noise, cubic space, air, pollution and sanitation which have an important bearing on the health and welfare of the workers. He should be acquainted with the raw materials, processes and products manufactured. He should also study the various Aspects of occupational physiology such as occurrence of fatigue, night work, shift work, weight carried by the workers and render advice to the factory. Management on all matters connected with the health and welfare of the workers. For studies of this kind the physician should enlist the cooperation of safety engineers, industrial hygienists and psychologists. Maintenance and analysis of records. Proper records are essential for the planning, development and efficient operation of an occupational health service. The worker's health record and occupational disability record must be maintained. Their compilation and review should enable the service to watch over the health of the workers, to assess the hazards inherent in 
certain types of work and to devise or improve preventive measures. Health Education and Counseling Ideally, health education should start before the worker enters the factory. All the risks involved in the industry in which he is employed and the measures to be taken for personal protection should be explained to him. The correct use of protective devices like masks and gloves should also be explained. Simple rules of hygiene, hand washing, paring the nails, bodily cleanliness and cleanliness of clothes should be impressed upon him. 2. 3.7.3 Engineering Measures Design of Building Measures for the Prevention of Occupational Diseases should commence in the blueprint stage. The type of floor, walls, height, ceiling, roof, doors and windows, cubic space are all matters which should receive attention in the original plan of the building which is put up by the industrial architect. Good housekeeping, good housekeeping is a term often applied to industry and means much the same as when used domestically. It covers general cleanliness, ventilation, lighting, washing, food arrangements and general maintenance. Good housekeeping is a fundamental requirement for the control or elimination of occupational hazards. General ventilation, there should be good general ventilation in factories. It has been recommended that in every room of a factory, ventilating openings shall be provided in the proportion of 5 square feet for each worker employed in such room, and the openings shall be such as to admit a continued supply of fresh air. In rooms where dust is generated there should be an efficient, exhaust ventilation system. Good general ventilation decreases the airborne hazards to the workers, especially hazards from dusts and gases. The Indian Factories Act has prescribed a minimum of 500 c feet of air space for each worker. Mechanization The plant should be mechanized to the fullest possible extent to reduce the hazard of contact with harmful substances. Dermatitis can be prevented if hand mixing is replaced by mechanical devices. Acids can be conveyed from one place to another through pipes. Substitution by substitution is meant the replacement of a harmful material by a harmless one or one of lesser toxicity. A classical example is the substitution of white phosphorus by phosphorus sesquicylfide in the match industry, which resulted in the elimination of necrosis of jaw, fossy jaw, dot, zinc or iron paints can be used in place of harmful lead paints, silver salts can be used in place of mercury salts, acetone can be used in place of benzene. But substitution is not always possible in industry. Dusts, dust can be controlled at the point of origin by water sprays, example, wet drilling of rock. Inclusion of a little moisture in the materials will make the processes of grinding, sieving and mixing comparatively dust-free. Wet methods should be tried to combat dust before more elaborate and expensive. Methods are adopted. Enclosure. Enclosing the harmful materials and processes will prevent the escape of dust and fumes into the factory atmosphere. For example, grinding, machinery can be completely enclosed. Such enclosed units are generally combined with exhaust ventilation, isolation. Sometimes it may be necessary to isolate the offensive process in a separate building so that workers not directly connected with the operation are saved from exposure. Isolation may not be only in space, but also in the fourth dimension of time. Certain operations can be done at night in the absence of the usual staff, local exhaust ventilation, by providing local exhaust ventilation dusts. Fumes and other injurious substances can be trapped and extracted at source before they escape into the factory atmosphere. The heart of the local exhaust ventilation is the hood which is placed as near as possible to the point of origin of the dust or fume or other impurity. Dusts, gases and fumes are drawn into the hood by suction and are conveyed through ducts into collecting units. In this way, the breathing zone of workers may be kept free of dangerous, dust and poisonous fumes, protective devices, respirators and gas masks are among the oldest devices 
used to protect workers against airborne contaminants and they are still used for that purpose. There are two classes of respirators, I, those which remove contaminants from air, to those to which fresh air is supplied. The workers should know what kinds to use and when and how to use. The other protective devices comprise earplugs, ear muffs, helmets, safety shoes, aprons, gloves, gum boots, barrier creams, screens and goggles, environmental monitoring, an important aspect of occupational health program is environmental monitoring. It is concerned with periodical environmental surveys, especially sampling the factory atmosphere to determine whether the dusts and gases escaping into the atmosphere are within the limits of permissible concentration. The use of permissible limits has played an important part in reducing occupational exposure to toxic substances. Thermal environment, ventilation, lighting would also have to be monitored, statistical monitoring, statistical monitoring comprises review at regular intervals of collected data on health and environmental exposure of occupational groups. The main objective of these reviews is to evaluate the adequacy of preventive measures and occupational health criteria, including permissible exposure levels, research, Research in occupational health offers fertile ground for study, which can provide a better understanding of the industrial health problems. There are two kinds of research, pure research and research for the improvement of or in connection with the manufactured product. Both are important. Study of the permissible limits of exposure to dusts and toxic fumes, occupational cancer, accident prevention, industrial fatigue and Vocational psychology are some aspects of research in occupational health. 3.7.4 Legislative measures, the important legislations to safeguard the health and welfare of the industrial workers in India are follows, the Factories Act, 1948, the Employee State Insurance Act, 1948, Maternity Benefits Act, 1961, the Mines Act, 1952, all these acts lay down certain standards to which the employer must comply to ensure health and safety of workers, the Factories Act, 1948, objective to consolidate and amend the law regulating the workers. Working in the factories To safeguard the interest of workers and protect them from exploitation, the Act prescribes certain standards with regard to safety, welfare and working hours of workers Apart from other provisions, applicability extends to whole of India. Coverage The Act defines factory as an establishment employing 10 or more workers where power is used and 20 or more workers where power is not used. The Employee State Insurance Act, 1948. Objective is an important measure of social security and health. Insurance in India. It provides for certain cash and medical. Benefits to industrial employees in case of sickness, maternity and employment injury. ESI applicability extends to whole of India applicable to non-seasonal. Factories employing 10 or more person scheme has been extended to shops, hotels, restaurants, cinemas including preview theatres, road motor transport undertakings and newspaper establishments employing 10 or more. Persons. Scheme has been extended to private medical and educational institutions employing 10 or more persons. In certain states, UTs, ESI eligibility, the existing wage limit for coverage under the Act is Rs. 21,000 per month. WF 1st January 2017, ESI benefits medical benefit, sickness benefit, maternity benefit, dependence benefit, disablement benefit. Funeral Benefit, Rehabilitation Benefit, Rajiv Gandhi Shramik Kalyan Yojana, Rate of ESI Contribution, Contribution by Employers. Employees Employer Contributes, 4.75% of Total Wage, Bill Employee Contributes 1.75% of Wages, Contribution by Government State, Government Contributes 1.8 at Y ESI, Corporation Contributes 7.8 at of the Expense incurred in providing medical benefit benefits to employers 
exemption from the applicability of Workmen's Compensation Act 1923, exemption from Maternity Benefit Act 1961, exemption from payment of medical allowance to employees and their dependents or arranging for their medical care, rebate under the Income Tax Act on contribution. Deposited in the ESI account, Healthy Workforce, 3.8 Global Strategy on Occupational Health for All, the Global Strategy on Occupational Health for All presents a short situation. Analysis by using available occupational health indicators identifies the most evident needs for the development of occupational health and safety, including the priority areas at both national and international levels and proposes the priority actions for whose workers' health program the 10 priority objectives proposed by the strategy are as follows. 1. Strengthening of international and national policies for health at work and developing the necessary policy tools. 2. Development of healthy work environment. 3. Development of healthy work practices and promotion of health at work. 4. Strengthening of occupational health services. OS. 5. Establishment of support services for occupational health. 6. Development of occupational health standards based on scientific risk assessment. 7. Development of human resources for occupational health. 8. Establishment of registration and data systems. Development of information, services for experts, effective transmission of data, and raising of public awareness through public information. 9. Strengthening of research. 10. Development of collaboration in occupational health and with other activities and services. Global Plan of Action on Workers' Health, 2008-2017, the 60th World Health Assembly, having considered the draft Global Plan of Action on Workers' Health, endorsed the Global Plan of Action on Workers' Health, 2008-2017 with the following objectives. 1. To devise and implement policy instruments on workers' health. 2. To protect and promote health at the workplace. 3. To improve the performance of an access to occupational health services. 4. To provide and communicate evidence for action and practice. 5. To incorporate workers' health into other policies. WHO, supported by its network of collaborating centers for occupational health and in partnership with other intergovernmental and international organizations, will work with the Member States to implement this plan of action by promoting and engaging in partnership and joint action with ILO and other organizations of the United Nations system, organizations of employers, trade, unions and other stakeholders in civil society and the private sector in order to strengthen international efforts on workers' health, consistent with the actions undertaken by ILO, setting standards for protection of workers' health, providing guidelines, promoting and monitoring their use, and contributing to the adoption and implementation of international labor conventions, articulating policy options for framing national agendas for workers' health based on best practices and evidence, providing technical support for tackling the specific health needs of working populations and building core institutional capacities for action on workers' health, monitoring and addressing trends in workers' health. Establishing appropriate scientific and advisory mechanisms to facilitate action on workers' health at global and regional levels, progress in implementing the plan of action will be reviewed and monitored using a set of national and international indicators of achievement, 3.9 summary. In this unit, you have learnt about the definition and the concept of occupational health and the burden of occupational diseases. The concept of ergonomics and its applications in improving the health at workplace have also been described in detail. You have been familiarized with the concept and reasons of sickness, absenteeism. Further, various types of occupational hazards, their impact on health and how hazard analysis and risk assessment of occupational environment can be done have been explained in detail. Various kinds of diseases which can be acquired at the workplace and the exposures responsible have been discussed at length. You have also learnt about the modalities of prevention and control of 
occupational diseases and the legislations and organization existing in India to safeguard the health and welfare of the industrial workers. Thank you. Subscribe to our channel for more updates and we will see you with the next chapter.